So I, I think in a way what I imagined is coming to fruition. So I totally have no regrets whether uh, for, you know, if, if I didn't go to Wall Street or Silicon Valley, I think this is, this is where I belong. Yeah. And, uh, so let's be honest, yeah. Being a black, <laughs> being a yeah. black person and surviving in America, right? Thriving might come later, but surviving in America, the way it's structured with its social yeah. catch or complications, I just wasn't ready to, you know, to, to try and survive there. So home yeah. is home. The motherland was calling. I had to come back. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning in again. Uh, my name is Fahad Mukunzi, and I'm the host of the Bold African Show. Today, we have a very special guest from uh, Kenya, uh, Ed Magema, and he is the uh, he's an entrepreneur in the education technology and uh, financial technology. He has tremendous experience on the African continent. And he's also a graduate uh, from Harvard University. So he recently wrote a book called uh, How to Get into Harvard. He's going to be talking more about uh, that as well. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest. Uh, welcome, Ed. So thank you so much uh, for the welcome. I'm happy to, to speak to our, our fellow brethren and sisters. So yeah, let's, let's do this. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a pleasure hosting you. We have a lot to un unpack here. I guess to start, can you tell us about the ventures that you're currently working on? Yeah, for sure. Um, currently, I'm running um, a startup called GCSP, which stands for Global Colleges Scholars Platform. And the purpose for that platform is to connect learners to any tutors uh, around the world at any time, anywhere. Uh, so it's a digital platform uh, that I think is just timely, especially in the situation where we are, uh, where we've been forcefully ushered into the digital learning space by COVID. I think that time was due. Uh, so it's it's just I, I feel great about what we're doing and um, looking really looking forward to launch our platform very soon. Um, on the other hand, I'm also a fintech expert, uh, mostly dealing with. Uh, the payments collection space and remittances. Uh, so I'm focused on building a payment infrastructure with a with a, with a number of people uh, drawn from all over the world, and you're building a payment infrastructure that accommodates a payment on mobile money. So that's uh, that's the other thing that I'm really really focused on. Yeah. Wow. That yeah, you're doing a lot. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back to uh, GCSP platform and talk a bit more about that. So you started that when you were still a student at Harvard and then continued working on it when you went back home. Uh, so what prompted you to start that uh, education technology platform? Sorry, I missed the last point. Oh, what, what motivated you to start the CSP? Yeah, so uh, I actually started the, the, so the conceptualization of the idea was back even before I started Harvard. Uh, so I noticed when I was applying to college, uh, there's just very few resources and people who uh, who will support you to, to do that extensive application successfully, actually. So I said, why not start, you know, a small group of people who are interested in providing support to other students so that they can also you know, get quality support to you know, make applications and get admissions and scholarships. So that's where this all this started. Um, when I came back, I registered the company in 2017, and then uh, starting from last year, we began thinking about, so if we really want to reach scale and support as many people as possible through this process, and not just for college applications, uh, but also for, you know, learner to tutor, because that connection is also very important. Uh, what can we do? That's when the digital digitization aspect came through and we said, actually, let's digitize. So when COVID struck this year, uh, it was just like, you know, pressing the gas pedal and we said, you know, let's run with this now. So we are just about to roll out our MVP um, in the next uh, two to two or so weeks. Uh, so we're really excited about it. Yeah, great. Yeah, so you want to help uh, other, you know, scholars or students who want to go to study 
um, abroad to, to be able to access the resources that you didn't have uh, when you were uh, at that stage in your life when you wanted to go uh, to study to get good education. So, but you managed to get into Harvard without those resources. So, how did you get into it? Like, how did you learn about the possibility of uh, going to Harvard, and how how did you go about applying and actually f and finally getting into Harvard? Well, um, I'll say you know some of these things is almost just like how you caught. So if you lose somebody and they can't, you know, they can't resist you. That's that's how it happens. <laughs> yeah, but I'm kidding. Um, it was quite a process. Um, I had to do those extensive applications as well as do the tests. And certainly, you have to pass all of those things, right? Uh, you know, get yeah. your recommendations from the teachers, other people who know you, uh, and those have to come out in the strongest terms possible. I mean, positively. Uh, so I got everything together. I had a good story. You know, I went to school here in a very small school, uh, but I performed above, I think, 0.01% of the population uh, for students here. We have a national examination called KCAC, uh, Kenya Certificate of Secondary Education. So I was uh, out of more than half a million people, I think number six. Uh, so that really, really was a strong story to tell about my academic abilities. So I shared a story. I also shared about uh, my ambition as a person, what I want to achieve in the future, uh, my perspectives on different topics that were being asked. So I think they, they must have loved my story. And so they, they thought that I, you know, I, I deserved a place at Harvard and I was given that opportunity, admission opportunity, together with full scholarship. Yeah. So actually I came to five other top schools like Yale and Columbia, but, you know, Harvard is Harvard. It's very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the godfather of, of universities. Um, great. So you, you got into Harvard and, and what was the experience like for, for people who, who are wondering, like, what was it like to study at Harvard? Uh, what kind of things did you see that, you know, make Harvard stand out? Um, well, if I was to summarize Harvard in a sentence, I would say it's an upbeat, competitive, above, you know, your, your neck has to be above the water at all times. <laughs> yeah. Whether you're in class, whether you're doing extracurricular activities, whether you are looking for your internships or full-time employment, like what, what, like the environment itself just makes you want to perform above average or rather in, yeah. in your top shape. So that's how, how you know, I'll characterize Harvard, uh, but it doesn't really start to uh, to summarize what the more than I think 360 years of its existence really looks like. The, the, the school was founded in uh, 1636, so it's, it's as old as is much much older than a lot of our institutions and countries uh, in the world. So it has all that pedigree from all these years. That when you step in, it's almost difficult to imagine that you're there. Let me just say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. If I was to speak about my freshman year, I usually tell people, you know, I, I was coming from a small town in Kenya, uh, mm -hmm. farther away from Nairobi. I'd never seen, you, you see, before 2012, we didn't even have, uh, we didn't have underground roads here in Kenya, tunnels, right, in our highway yeah. system. So I go there and I see a, a tunnel through uh, a highway and I was like, where are those cars going, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I was so yeah. green. Um, the environment was so new, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was shocking, right? Yeah. Uh, first year, but first year was amazing. I met a lot of people from all different parts of the world. For the first time, I saw all different shades of brown and white and whichever color you want to call them. Yeah. Um, I immersed myself into that, you know, into that uh, ecosystem. I, I met so many friends. Uh, I most likely got to know half of the 1,600 plus students in my freshman year. Uh, you know, through our dining hall, uh, chats in class, outside activities. So first year was amazing. Second year uh, started to become difficult as I now dived into my, you know, my math concentration uh, major. And I started actually to realize I actually don't know what I thought I knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, something we like to call, uh, 
Yeah, we call yeah. sophomore slump. Like your grades deep a little bit, you're not used to the bees, you start seeing bees on your transcript and you're like, oh my God. Yeah. Um, third year, you know, you start to settle, you start to mature in the system and you're like, okay, now I need to unlearn the things I used to think, uh, the way I used to learn and appreciate this new learning environment, how tough it is, how flexible I need to be in my approach to, to learning. And you start now to get things, right? Uh, you start to, uh, if you lost your friends during your sophomore year because you started to get busy, you can start reaching back to them and you know you start growing a community of mature people. Fourth year was a blast, almost like first year. Uh, you know, you're just about to get done, so you're relaxing, you're just easing in. And, uh, you know, you, you're more focused on what's to come, which is likely your career or graduate school. So th those are the four years, actually, for, for college, at least from Harvard's yeah. perspective and my perspective. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Uh, so you graduated in 2015 um, and, and then went back right away, went back home? Immediately. <laughs> so what motivated you to go back? Because most people who go to those, like, elite, uh, schools like Ivy Leagues, they get offers before they even graduate from these big companies. Did you get any offers that you rejected? Um, I, and what was, what was... I, I yeah. got an offer from, uh, what, what are they called? Uh, Dow Jones. You know, uh -huh. the guys who run uh, Market Watch. So they are yeah. huge, uh, what do you like character? So they are huge technology company that focuses on market news. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, industrial. Uh, so I had a I had a chance with them, but I was I was like I need to go back home because I believe <laughs> there is a much greener space in terms of opportunities that could be developed into something you know big, uh, something yeah. pan African. Um, and also I had other things that I wanted to do, like get a little bit into you know, political discussions and, and whatnot. So I came mm -hmm. back here, I got involved in that. It was exciting uh, before now jumping fully into entrepreneurship. So I, I think in a way what I imagined is coming to fruition. So I totally have no regrets whether uh, for, you know, if, if I didn't go to Wall Street or Silicon Valley, I think this is this is where I belong. Yeah. And, uh, so let's be honest, yeah. <laughs> being a black, <laughs> being a yeah. black person and surviving in America. Right? Thriving might come later, but surviving in America the way it's structured with its social yeah. uh, cultural complications, I just wasn't ready to, you know, to, to try and survive there. So home yeah. is home. The motherland was calling. I had to come back. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you saw more value. You could be uh, more of a resource to the motherland, right? And you wanted to give back. You, you learned all these skills acquired all this knowledge, you're like, okay, let me go back home and solve some problems on the continent. Um, yeah, so what would you tell people who actually go to school and then, you know, end up maybe on Wall Street or working for corporations? Um, what would you tell them uh, in terms of what you've learned, you, you know, launching your ventures and solving problems on the African continent? Are there opportunities for them that can, um, you know, maybe lead to more success than just getting these gigs in, in the US or wherever else they go to school? Well, uh, it depends what somebody wants to do, right? If somebody wants to do investment banking and they want to focus on derivatives, probably Africa is not their place to be, right? So they should probably just stick with Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley yeah. in New York. But if you're looking for the larger, you know, newer fields, um, uh, you know, construction sector, real estate, if you're looking for uh, fintech, financial technology, um, you know, education technology, then this is the space to be. There's so much that still has to be done. Uh, there's so much that still needs to be created for us to even get to a point where we say, uh, I'm comfortable with the pace with which Africa as a continent is developing. So there's so much opportunity here, literally, like you can, yeah. you can plant yourself on your, and even on the comment on, uh, you know, wanted to do derivatives. For example, the Nairobi Stock Exchange was thinking about starting a derivatives unit. We don't have it yet. So if you have your four or five years experience in New York, in LA, you can come back here, you know, and, and build yeah. something that's not there. I yeah. think at the end of the day, if we have cumulative 
uh, resourcefulness, cumulative, uh, you know, uh, sort of like coming together and working together to build things which really matter and can propel us forward. Yeah. And you know, come back, come back. Let's let's do some really good stuff. Yeah. So there's there are tons of opportunities here. That's what I think. Yeah. Great. Yeah. We'll talk. We'll talk more about um, you know Africa's future and you know, your experience there uh, later. Um, but I wanted to talk about the book that you recently wrote. Uh, how to get into Harvard, uh, Three Simple Steps. Uh, can you talk about what motivated you to write the book? Yeah, so uh, for one reason, you know, um, I was an average kid uh, who went to a super, super average or actually below average school. Uh, and I know like there are tons of those kind of kids right now. There are, uh, there are millions of them. They form the majority. They don't have an idea of what it takes to get into a good school like Harvard. But now here's, here's the cut, right? It's not just about Harvard. It's about how to be excellent, which nobody really teaches you how to be. You don't get that in school. You don't really get that even at your workplace. So for those, you know, for the young people out there who are in primary school, uh, elementary school, who are in secondary school and high schools, and even for those who want to pursue master, their masters, wherever thing in their, in their, in their life, I think this this book is just right for them because what I share is exactly some of the tools and thinking methodologies that I've used over the years to get to where I am. Listen, I'm not saying I'm successful. I'm not even a dollar millionaire yet, <laughs> but I yeah. think I'm there and I have no doubts. So what I'm really sharing is uh, how I've trained my mind to think the way it is to to sort of like. Uh, overcome some of those critical obstacles that a lot of people face. Uh, some of these ob obstacles uh, include things like, you know, poverty, include things like uh, lack of exposure, lack of information and knowledge, uh, include things like just not really believing yourself. Listen, yeah. Fad, one thing, there's one, one very important uh, thing that I've mentioned in the book. It's just a very simple question that I really, really want everybody to really understand what it means. And it's, it goes something like this. Why not you? Mm. If other people are getting their start, if other people are succeeding, if other people are excelling in that specific passion and fields in academia, whichever space, why not you? Yeah. So actually that's the message for the book. Why not you? Yeah, yeah. that, that is very uh, interesting. So. You, you know, as a kid from small town in, in, in Kenya, you know, you were able to make it into Harvard and you were able to, you know, learn, uh, you know, alongside other, you know, top 1%, you know, students from, from all over the world. Um, and so this experience that you had, you want, you know, other people like you who grew up in, in the, who grew up in the condition that you grew up in, you want to show them they have that opportunity as well. You know, they can do it. Uh, if you did it, they can also do it. And you documented um, the process uh, in this book. So, yeah, thanks for, for writing that book and share, sharing knowledge. It's something that, you know, more Africans should probably do, um, you know, because, you know, that the culture of reading is not as rich as it is maybe in the West, but by you you know, writing that book and putting it out there, someone is going to pick it and it's going to change their lives, you know? Yeah. So congratulations on that. Uh, and where can people find the book and how can they uh, get a hold of it? Well, thank you so much for the congratulatory message. Um, yeah, so one thing is uh, they can, you know, find me on Instagram. I think we're actually live on Instagram, right? So they can just find oh, me on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah they can find me on Instagram. Ed Magema, and they can DM me, feel free. I'm happy to, to chat to anyone who's interested in getting the book. But also if you want a, if you want a digital copy, it's already on Amazon. So just go to Amazon, type in my name, the book will pop up. I think there's yeah. only one Ed Magema on Amazon, which is amazing if you think about it. <laughs> yeah, I was able to find your book when I, when I typed in uh, Ed Magema. But we will also link to it. Uh, we'll yeah. also link to it on, on, on YouTube and wherever we'll, we'll, we'll post this interview so that people can find the book. Um, yeah, great. So, all right. What about 
uh, other ventures that you're currently working on. So you're, you're working on a payments platform, right? Yes, uh, payments platform. Yeah, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so, uh, so uh, I'm not in a position to dive into the final details of what uh, I'm working on because we are still on stealth mode. Uh, but essentially, looking at Africa the way it is, right? Um, if you look at the different payments uh, schemes that are that are available for for most people, you'll find that a lot of them don't work for for, for the typical African, right? A lot of uh, of our people cannot access banks because the touch point for banks, which include brick and mortar houses, you know, the the buildings that that houses the banks uh, and the ATM, they are so far away from most people. Yeah, uh, I wish I had the the, st the the specific statistics to share, but it could be like you know, on average, people probably have to travel on average, say in Kenya, uh, for out of the forty-eight million people, probably on average, a single person has to travel a hundred kilometers to get access to a bank. Yeah, that's just not going to cut it. If he wants to create a country or a continent that is financially inclusive, where if I want to get money, if I want to get paid, if it's a salary, if it's a wage, if it's for something I've sold, then I just, you know, get paid, right? Why should I, why should I just get paid? And banks are not uh, solving for that. Uh, credit cards and debit cards are not solving for that. So there's only one solution that we all know that makes sense for us as, as a continent, and that's mobile money. So that's yeah. exactly what we're building. We're building yeah. an infrastructure that allows you, Fahad, if you come to uh, Gali and you are there somebody somewhere in one of the uh, districts, uh, you know, having a good time, you want to pay for your beer. We just, yeah. the tap of the bottom. You know, we yeah. know that functionality is there, but think about it this way a little bit. You're here, you've come for holiday, you just want to chill in the house on a, on a Sunday evening, right? And you just want to watch Netflix. But your card is not working because sometimes these cards mm -hmm. just don't work. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't pay for Netflix still. You really want to watch Netflix. The yeah. other option that you have is mobile money, but then Netflix is not connected to mobile money at any place here on the continent. So yeah. what do you need? So, you, you know, that's, those are kind of some, some kinds of, the, you know, some typical problems that you want to solve for. Problems yeah. that will allow a lot of our people, millions and millions of people to tap in to tap into the digital uh, commerce space, the e-commerce space at the touch of yeah. a button. Yeah, that's, so that's, yeah, that's great. Doing. Yeah, that yeah, that's great. Absolutely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see you know what you build, and hopefully, when it launches, we're gonna talk more about it. Um, yes. But yeah, so <laughs> great. So you have uh, quite a few things going uh, that keeps you busy. <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> but I, I like to think I'm productive. <laughs> yeah. So you, you've been doing business in Africa for uh, five years now, right? Since you graduated from school. Yeah. Uh, what yes. kind of challenges have you seen in the, in, in the, mar in the marketplace? Um, maybe we can talk specifically about Kenya, starting a business in Kenya and going to market. What kind of challenges have you faced? There, in business, you know, business is like a race. There are always challenges, right? Um, if you're racing, they like to use the analogy of Formula One, right? So you have to have a team that cooperates. So you need people who are talented. But even if those people are talented and they're not cooperating, you won't go far. So one, some of the things that I've, I've, I've seen to be problematic in just, you know, moving us from a stage where we are focused on SMEs, uh, and, and then, you know, leap, leapfrogging that and getting to a place where you're saying you're actually building billion dollar companies, you know, uh, unicorns uh, yeah. in the parlance of uh, Silicon Valley. So these things are talent. There's just, you know, they, there's talent, trust me. Like in Kenya, there's a lot of talent, but it's just not the right talent. It's not in the right, what will I say, it's not in the right format, especially in terms of people just putting 100% of their talents and continually recreating and innovating on that talent. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing that I've seen to be problematic, especially when it comes, especially on the FinTech side is regulation. Um, it's really difficult to, to put up a FinTech business. Yeah. Uh, just with regulation is, 
Yeah, regulation is either too rigid, too slow. It cannot catch up with innovation. And you know, when you're in, you're, when you're on the, in, the, in the payments industry, you want to innovate as quickly as possible because there's, there's so much competition, especially from banks and existing uh, telecommunication companies. So like MTN yeah. and, and other people like that, right? Um, the other issue uh, that I've seen uh, that we can work on is um, I say infrastructure is still a big issue. Um, whether you want to do education, whether you want to do payments, infrastructure is still a big issue, especially if your innovation depends on existing legacy infrastructure. So if I'm building a payments uh, company that that you know is relying on uh, you know a telecommunications company. Uh, and yeah. if that telecommunications company's um, technology is outdated, probably if they're using 3G and my technology is focused on 4G plus, then you see there's a divide and I can't move, I can't move my innovation forward, you see? Yeah. There are roads, things like roads, things like communication lines, things like internet, especially in a digital era that we are in, uh, are things which we are still grappling with. If I step mm -hmm. out of Nairobi today, <laughs> If I yeah. step out of Nairobi right now, I love problems accessing my, you know, my workstation, which is, you know, you know which is online, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So we have those things to deal with. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, given the kind of systems we have, politics is a big issue. Politics affects our taxation system, which affects our businesses. It affects the kinds of acts and laws that govern our business systems. So if a lot of times you don't have the right policies or rather the enabling policies to spark growth and innovation. Yeah. yeah. Matter of fact, Kenya just got a startup uh, bill that, uh, that is being considered to be uh, to, you know, for, for, for an act as a, to become an act of parliament. But that, uh, that bill is problematic. It's, it, it does not even define a startup. <laughs> so yeah. you can see. And this is yeah. Kenya. Remember, <laughs> This is, yeah, that is just Kenya. Right. But, so yeah, I, I've heard a lot of stories, you know, you know, Africa is, is huge. When, when we talk about Africa for, you know, for us Africans, we, we're passionate about Pan-Africanism. You know, when I see you, I see my brother, I see someone that looks like me, there's no difference really besides the borders. You know, I was born in this country, you were born in that country. There are 54 countries, but we all want to see, you know, Africa as one, you know, we want to be, we want to be able to do business, um, you know, across Africa uh, and then in your case you you know you have these online platforms where you can reach anybody anywhere in the world uh, but then penetrating those markets there, there might be a lot of um, you know obstacles so what, what do you think would be like the solution you know to that problem for African entrepreneurs to be able to um, you know provide services or the products to more than one country you know can you think of like the solutions that would lead to the point where they, the markets are open? Mm. Um, that's a difficult question uh, because what I've noticed, especially working across East Africa, is that uh, you know the way Rwanda approaches its business regime is a little mm. bit different from how Kenya approaches it. Uh, the same the same thing if you go to Uganda and if you go to Tanzania. A lot of these things have to do with our colonial history, for example. It has to do with the administrations that came right in after the colonial history, and they started putting in legacies, right? So, for example, in Kenya, you could say that uh, for you to get things sometimes, <laughs> it's a little normal to, to, to have to. It's not necessarily for you to do it, but to have to pay, uh, you know, a bribe. I've never done that, and I believe I, I wouldn't have to do it at any point in my in my life. But it's the reality of the business environment here, right? Yeah. So it's, it's difficult to start to to know where uh, the solution lies. But here is what I believe: if yeah. we have started concerted effort uh, in the business community in the startup uh, space, where startup founders say, "Listen, we are faced we are faced with this dilemma." It's a policy issue. It's a financial funding issue for for our businesses. Uh, it's a collaboration issue between us as, a, as as startup founders. The best thing we could do, the best starting point that we could do, is just come together. Yeah. Just come together and reason together and say, 
we have this one thing that one problem that we all cross share how do we solve for it listen yeah. we have so many smart people here but we, we are just not collaborating if we collaborate here in kenya and really really yeah. get to a place where our synergies are optimized then you can start reaching to people you know startup founders business founders the business community in uganda and say listen here in kenya we are doing things right like if you look yeah. at nigeria these guys came together and for the first time on the continent they are able to uh, you know to get to get angel investors together to get uh, venture capital firms together you know companies that can invest into startups and businesses locally and these are people yeah. drawn locally that is something unheard of in africa mm-hmm. So yeah. if we start collaborating and then we start do you know start locally in Kenya collaborate build build synergies build uh, a gravitas such good gravitas that you can go to Uganda and tell you know, the business community in Uganda in Rwanda in Tanzania that listen we are collaborating and we are seeing fruits out of this yeah. collaboration come let's come together build your own when you're ready let's form something one you know let's unite as one so that we can you know if we have 100,000 startup founders across Africa who are united they can go to the government and say you cannot for example the government of Uganda you cannot tax you know access to the internet because if you tax access to the internet you you are literally killing e-commerce people cannot buy from people who are very price sensitive cannot go to an e-commerce site and buy anything yeah right they cannot access mm-hmm. social media it starts to it starts to be a little retrogressive but if you if you're really united you can affect a lot of policies you can affect even funding you can even tell external funders from europe from america where most of the funding comes from that listen if you guys don't pour money into our startups you know as africans we we are going to really fight hard against <laughs> and compete against the startups that come from silicon valley yeah you get yeah. yeah so really i think if you ask me i think the answer lies in unity more than anything else yeah wow yeah that that's powerful that's powerful yeah so what would you tell people who want to uh come back home or who are in the diaspora who want to come and start a venture for instance in kenya uh, what advice would you give them that would help them uh prepare for that transition and actually set up you know solve a problem in Kenya and have a successful business i'll say you know start finding uh what uh, who who is in the startup community uh in these countries in Kenya in Rwanda in Uganda in Tanzania Nigeria South Africa start connecting to those people because they understand the realities on the ground you know you can come with uh, 10 million dollars and you want to build a technology product but you have zero idea about what the market how the market behaves you won't go far you know yeah. money can only take you uh, far as a company but when you have, when you combine uh, you know the power that money brings into a business with the intelligence on the ground i think you can go far so that's yeah. i think that's that's the most important thing that they can start doing connect 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 and who knows probably i will even say if you really feel like you can you can best serve when you're there don't even come back you know get us the money <laughs> Uh, you know, yeah. let, let's create, the money. Let's yeah. Of, yeah, let's create a pipeline of funding from Silicon Valley that an African, our fellow brother or sister, is controlling. Mm-hmm. Let's start. To, let's start to create pipelines that our own people are controlling. Whether those pipelines come from Silicon Valley, from Seattle, uh, from the UK, France, whichever place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, But I think that would be amazing. Otherwise, if you have other and other people controlling the funding pipeline they will still control your startup industry even in your own country yeah great yeah while we're still talking about this so are they so there are people who maybe want to contribute in terms of you know building and and solving problems but then they can't afford to be on the ground are there other ways um you you, you mentioned about sending money or investing are there ve- vehicles through which people can invest because a lot of people want to so, to help but they don't have um you know like a vehicle through which they can uh, put their their funds and then have have the the funds go to the right uh maybe investments or businesses is there uh any solutions around that in Kenya um 
not not very strong ones, but for one, uh, especially for people who are interested in uh, business, businesses that are just starting, so startups that are still in their, what we call the pre seed they, they haven't had their first fund injection yet. Um, there's a, there's a, you know, there's an angel network. It's called, I think, the Africa Angel Business Angel Network. Yeah. Eba. So we can start by tapping into that because these are people who are given to funding businesses that have no proof that they work. Okay, they have a proof, which we like to call the market fit, but these are not these are not these are not big businesses like Facebook or Safaricom or MTN, right? They are still very small. They're still in their pledging stages, but they have a lot of potential. So you can start by tapping into networks that already exist instead of trying to create one because there's so much complexity in trying to put together uh, an angel investment investment vehicle or a venture capital vehicle. So yeah. start by looking. So who exists? What is lacking? Is it funding? Then you know start to collate that funding from your side and. And you say, listen, I'm, I'm going to get you funding from here, and uh, I want a stake in your in your angel investment network. And yeah. I think it, it, could be, uh, it could be as as you know, uh, we set up a commercial deal between you and and that network and see what comes out of it. But at the end of the day, I'll tell you, Fahad, we need funding for startups mm. here in Kenya for angel investors. We need it, not yeah. just in Kenya, North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah, great. Yeah, that is, uh, you know, something I also think about a lot because I also uh, feel like not everyone is going to, uh, not everyone with resources or the knowledge going to, you know, come back home and and, and, and build the continent, but we can all try in, in uh, the ways that we can. And, and one that I see, because, you know, we already send money back home, um, you know, to take care of like day-to-day -day purchases and bills and, and helping out. Uh, why not invest that money in the business? Uh, I think, you know, if there is like a really yeah. solid uh, platform that actually enables that in a transparent way, uh, I think, you know, that would be a great, great resource to uh, especially the diaspora community. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I just, I just remembered. Uh, so there's the Angel Invest uh, Investment Network, uh, but is there, there are also accelerators which are doing amazing work in terms of uh, supporting businesses to refine their business models, really think about what kind of market they're targeting so that at the end of the day, they build something that can work. So accelerators, incubators, those are also very amazing uh, channels for you to put your money in. Yeah. So I, I don't have much information about how they actually work, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I encourage people, there are so many, trust me, there are so many uh, in East Africa. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll do link to uh, I'll link to the resources that you mentioned, and thank you so much. Uh, so when you were starting your entrepreneurial journey, let's say when you went back, uh, when you were just graduating from Harvard, uh, if you were to go back in time uh, to 2015, what would you do differently to prepare for your entrepreneurial journey? Um, maybe someone else that's uh, just you know, getting ready to take a leap of faith can take that from you and, and use it to that advantage. Mm, I think I will go work for a startup. If you want to be an entrepreneur, the best way to, to grow as an entrepreneur is to work for an entrepreneur, to learn from an entrepreneur. Because the way, the way startups operate is very different from how established businesses operate. Established businesses have gotten to a place where they have accumulated a lot of inertia. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy. But remember, those bureaucracies work for these <laughs> for these businesses. But yeah. those bureaucracies and inertia want to work for startups because how you define a startup it's it's a company that is set to grow at a very very fast pace. And in addition to that, what most people then say is that you're going to make a lot of mistakes in that initial stage. Those mistakes, you won't see them in an established business because processes have been set. There's management, the expectation from investors. In startups, those the expectation from investors, but they're so different. In startups, the investors might want you to grow 30 times in a year, 30x, right? Or grow your revenue 30x. 
in an established business, the investors will say, as long as I'm getting a dividend of $1 mm -hmm. <laughs> per share, I'm good. Okay, so very different place. So I'll say work for a startup to not a startup. I yeah. wish I did that. Yeah. Great, great, great advice. Thank you so much. Uh, and is there anything else that you want to share with the audience? Um, maybe for like young Africans uh, who are excited about the Africa's future? Um, I'll say, they, you know, as, I, as, I, as I've mentioned in the book, just ask yourself, why not me? You know, like um, you can be excellent if, 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 if there's something that you, you feel so passionate about, whether it's business, whether it's academia, uh, whether it's any line of, of career, just go for it. The people who get rewarded in this world, as I've seen in my few years of life, are the people who optimize on what they're really good at. Look at the likes of, I don't like to talk about white people, but here I'll say it. <laughs> Look at the likes of Bill Gates, right? He's known for one thing, and it's computers, right? Look at people like Steve Jobs who passed on. He was known for one thing, which was design, and he incorporated that design, the mastery of design, into Apple. Right now, I'm able to talk to you, Fahad, on my laptop, which is a Mac, because of Steve Jobs. Look at people like Venus Williams and Serena Williams. They are known for one thing, tennis. So look for that one or two things. When I speak about one, one or two things, you can look at Elon Musk, who's really good with space programs, as well as uh, you know motor vehicles, right? Electric vehicles. But look for that one thing that you're really good at, that you're really passionate at, and put all your energies into that thing. Very powerful Thank advice. Thank you so much, Ed. Um, it was a pleasure having you on the show. And how can people uh, get in touch with you if they want to reach out? Um, I think social media is good. I believe our audience is, is quite young and technological savvy. So <laughs> yeah. find me on um, DM me at any time. Um, I'm quite responsive. So my social media handle is Ed. Uh, it's Ed Magema. Wait, it's uh, The Magema. T H E. Yeah. The underscore Magema. But at any point, you can find me on LinkedIn, Ed Magema. Um, yeah, and just feel free to connect with me. I'm always happy to to support where I can and to learn where I can. Yeah, actually, I like learning <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, I will link to all your social media profiles so people can get in touch with you. I will link to the book on Amazon so people can you know grab the book. Um, and yeah, good luck with everything that you're doing, the ventures that you you you're creating. Um, we'll keep following your journey and hopefully, you know, we'll have another interview to talk about, you know, other ventures that you're currently working on. For sure. For sure. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak to my fellow Africans and it's always a pleasure. Thanks so much Fahad, for the opportunity and, uh, yeah, keep watching Fahad's show. It's amazing. I've seen the lineup <laughs> of people who are here. So yeah, this is a place to be. Let's keep on creating. All right. Thanks Ed. We'll talk on the other side.